John chapter 14, verses 7 through 11 will be our text this morning as we continue our study through the Gospel of John. John 14, picking up in verse 7 and going through verse 11. Verse 7, Christ is speaking, he says, If he had known me, he should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye shall know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and now sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Let's pray. We'll pray silently just for a moment. Ask the Lord to help you to understand his word as we pray silently together. And then we'll get into this text. Father, we thank you for inspiring John to write these words, and now we want to understand them, and so we need the power of the Holy Spirit to teach us. So we sit at your feet now, teach us your word, help us to learn more about you, help us to learn to love you more, help us to be able to serve you better, and may the lost be convicted, and may sinners be saved in Christ's name. Amen. Be seated, please. I think most of us Christians have known kind of what Philip was feeling when he asked Jesus, Lord, show us the Father. And the reason is that there are some times when God seems distant from us and our hearts want some kind of tangible sign that God's real and God's present. You've all been there, have you not? You know, God. Where are you in the midst of this trial I'm going through? Where are you in the midst of this sickness or, or the death of my loved one or the loss of a job or, or some kind of turmoil at work? Where are you, God? Let us see the Father. The, Jesus' disciples were confused and, and distressed about Jesus' impending departure. So Philip asked Jesus for an experience that would make their belief in God very real. And his request shows this longing of the hearts of mankind across the ages. They want to know that God is real. Now, not only does this scene resonate with the experience of many of us that we've had, it more generally deals with the situation of all Christians in this current age. Jesus was preparing his disciples for that time when he would no longer be physically with them after his death and resurrection and ascension into heaven. This is the very time that we experience our entire Christian life. We've come to faith in Christ through God's word, and so we love him and we follow him, but not one of us has ever seen God. We have never seen Jesus. We've never heard his human voice. God the Father and Jesus, his Son, are in heaven. They're distant from us, so we need a way to experience their presence. And this is the great subject of John chapters 14, 15, and 16, in which Jesus tells us of his provisions exactly for our situation today. We can't see Jesus, we can't hear him, we can't see God. How do we know they're real? How, how can we experience their presence? Well, we're going to learn that over the course of the next few weeks. Philip's question not only was prompted by the occasion of Jesus' soon departure, but also it was initiated by Jesus. Having told his disciples that he was going to the Father's house to prepare a place for them, Jesus wanted to further awaken their knowledge of the Father. And so he told them in verse 7, If ye had known me, 
you should have known my father also. The disciples did know Jesus, of course. They spent three years with him. But their poor understanding of the Father showed their inadequate understanding of Jesus himself. They had known him well enough to leave their homes, leave their friends, leave their jobs in order to follow him. But they didn't know just yet how important he was. The events that were about to take place are going to change all of that. And so Jesus added in verse 7, And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him, speaking of the Father. His words from henceforth indicate that the events that were about to happen would change their understanding of him and of the Father. Through Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the disciples would gain a very deep and insightful knowledge of God the Father. And in, in anticipation of these coming events, Jesus said, Ye know him and have seen him. So however certain the future knowledge was, Philip showed that it had not yet happened. And so he begged the Lord, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. I believe Philip was thinking about the Old Testament saints who had been given an immediate revelation of God's being. You recall that Moses asked God, I beseech you, show me thy glory in Exodus 33, 18. And God replied, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. You might recall that Elijah was given divine appearances. He was exhausted, exhausted with the confrontation uh, with the false prophets, wicked Ahab and Jezebel, and so he fled to Mount Sinai. He probably was going there to try to experience some kind of closeness to God. God then shook the mountain with a great wind, an earthquake, and a raging fire that we read about in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 11. So Philip's thinking about these things, and with those things in mind, he expressed his belief that if the disciples could only experience some audio-visual display of God, it would, in his word, suffice with us. That would be enough for us, God, if you would give us some kind of experience like that. An experience like that would, would pull the disciples together through whatever ordeals they're going to have to endure in the coming weeks and months. Philip thought, just as so many Christians today think, that spiritual experiences will help them through the trials of their life here on earth. They want to know that God's real. The charismatics are filled with this kind of thing. They want to see these signs and, and, and something that will make God real. Uh, a, a local pastor, I, I heard him say, I was up in the balcony and, and I saw this friend who had a short arm and all of a sudden it grew. So that made God, that made God real to him. And, and he tells that story to make God real to the, you know, God can make arms grow and, and he can... You know, we, we had the faith healers that run around on the stage and stick their fingers in people's ears and say, come out thou foul death spirit, and, and all of a sudden they can hear. And so they see these visible manifestations of God, and it makes them real to them, although that's not what Jesus is teaching us here. This is what Philip was thinking, though. Give us a vision. Let us something tangible that we can grab hold of. Another way to understand Philip is to realize the connection he was making between seeing and believing. His whole point was that if the disciples could see the Father somehow, they would then be able to believe in him more. And Jesus challenged this way of thinking by asking, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? There in verse 9. 
There, there was probably a bit of exasperation in Jesus' voice when he spoke those words, but Jesus was also making a very important point. Philip said that he could believe if only his eyes could see this visual display of the Father. But Philip had seen Jesus in this way for roughly three years now, but he had not from that time come to understand him and, and fully believe. Jesus thus refutes this idea of seeing as believing, at least when it comes to the king, uh, the, kind of see, the kind of seeing that Philip had in mind. Now, it's helpful, I think, in this respect to realize in the Greek language used in the New Testament, there are a number of different Greek words for the English word see or seeing, much like the word love. You're familiar with that, the Greek words eros for uh, romantic love, phileo for brotherly love, the common word that we use, uh, agape for this self-sacrificial love. Uh, we understand that that Greek word has different meanings. Well, it has different meanings for seeing in the New Testament. Uh, we can compare these words by seeing how they're used uh, later on in John's Gospel when he's talking about Peter and John's inspection of the empty tomb after Jesus' resurrection. Now, the most, most basic word for seeing is the Greek word blepo, and it means a, a visual apprehension of physical objects. I'm looking at this flower. I see that. I'm seeing that. That's blepo. Uh, this word is used when we're told that John saw the linen clothes lying in the empty tomb. So John goes in, and he sees these things, blepo. As uh, the second word for seeing is used when Peter arrives at the tomb. And he pushed in after John. And verse 6 of that same chapter, John chapter 20 says that Peter went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie. Here we have a different Greek word, thoreo, from which we get our English word theory or to theorize. So Peter not only saw the clothes, but he marveled over them, and he, he was theorizing as to what this all meant. How, how could Jesus' body be gone, and, and why were the grave clothes still lying there in the tomb? Later that evening, Jesus appeared in a room where the disciples had gathered, and he showed them his hands and his side. And we read in verse 20, again in that same chapter, when the, the, there were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Here the Greek word is a form of edo, which means to perceive, to notice, to discern, to discover. And they're discovering that. And then there's the word horao, meaning to see with the mind, to perceive, to know. And that was used in verse 25 of John chapter 20. We have seen the Lord. We have with our mind perceived him and we know him to be the Lord. The difference between these words for seeing becomes important in understanding Jesus' answer to Philip's request to see the Father. Jesus said, he that hath seen me has seen the Father and the word that he uses here is the word we just talked about, horeo, meaning to see with the mind, to perceive, and to know. And so Jesus is saying to Philip, if you see me, you have perceived, you have known the Father. Anyone who has comprehended or understood him has also seen and comprehended and understood the Father. So Philip, <clears throat> he asked for a vision. <clears throat> he wanted some kind of physical manifestation or demonstration of God the Father. All this time, Jesus had been giving demonstrations that Philip wanted. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. If Philip had understood Jesus, he would have comprehended the Father in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. 
So Jesus' answer to Philip is a very important statement concerning the Christian faith. He that has seen me has seen the Father. This is really the very heart of our belief that Jesus Christ came into this world to reveal God the Father to mankind, to show us in his life and ministry what God is like and to reveal to us by his gospel how God intends to save us. And this teaching is so important. Uh, lost my place here. This teaching is so important that John wrote about it right at the beginning of his gospel. You'll recall John chapter 1 and verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. This truth is one of the most important parts of our witness to others about Christ. In speaking about Jesus, we have to explain that he is the one who came from heaven to show us God. Jesus might have shown us God in a number of ways, two of which I think are particularly noteworthy. One is by demonstration. If you know someone personally, if you spent some time with that person, you're able to picture him or her to other people. We were talking about this in our family just the other day. I have an aunt, her name is Zula, and she looks and acts very, very much like my mother did. She has the same voice inflections. She has the same mannerisms. She has the same attitude that my mom had. And because I knew my mother, I could see her very clearly in this particular aunt. In a similar way, Jesus represented God the Father to mankind. Because of our alienation from God, our, our race, the human race, has lost contact with our maker. But Jesus came into the world and his demeanor, his tone of voice, his attitude, his reaction to events were the very same as those of God the Father. Jesus was familiar with God the Father, having come from the presence of God's glory in heaven. In fact, Jesus is God's own son, so he possesses all the family traits and mannerisms. Each of us has a desperate need to know God, and verse 9 makes it vitally important statement that Jesus reveals God the Father. To see Jesus and comprehend his mind, his heart, his character, and his habits is to comprehend God. God is always and only Christ-like, so that the more we know Christ, the more we know God. And this revelation of God is what prompts our faith, because to comprehend God in Christ is to trust and adore him and worship him. He that has seen me has seen the Father, Jesus is telling us. Jesus is the revelation of God, and that revelation staggers our minds and leads us then to love and praise him, as we're doing this morning. It's not enough, however, to say that Jesus represents God because of his close familiarity with the Father. Jesus grounds his revelation of the Father more deeply, speaking of the mutual indwelling of the Father in him and he in the Father. Verses 9 and 10. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? Not only just does Jesus show us what the Father is like, but Jesus shows us the Father since the Father is in him. Now, while the Father and Son are distinct persons, they have this unity of being so that Jesus reveals God because he is God. Jesus reveals the Father because the Father is in him as they not only collaborate on their works, but they also share the same fundamental nature. 
the, the true ground of knowing the Father in the Son is the unity of essence between the Father and the Son. Jesus has come to earth as more than just a divine messenger, a servant who brings a message from God. Were he an only messenger, Jesus would never say that by seeing him, we actually see the Father. Instead, the Father has come to us in his Son so that we might know him, the one who cannot be seen, and be reconciled to him through faith in Jesus Christ. When it comes to knowing God, Jesus is like the Rosetta Stone. Maybe you've heard of that. This was part of a second century BC Egyptian monument discovered during the, during the Napoleonic Nile campaign in 1799. It was so valuable because it was written with a text of three different language, including the Egyptian hieroglyphics and the Greek language. Up until then, People had seen these, these Egyptian hieroglyphics, but they had no idea what they meant until they discovered the Rosetta Stone that had the hieroglyphics and the Greek. Uh, people knew the Greek. The scholars back then knew the Greek, and so they could read the Greek letters and see the hieroglyphic letters that corresponded with the Greek letters, and now they could understand the hieroglyphics. It would be like if we had a stone with Spanish and English on it written side by side, and we would see the Spanish word hola, and the English word hello, and we would say, oh, hola means hello, and we understand Spanish. We could read, como esta usted? What does that mean? I don't understand Spanish. Well, it's written over here in English. How are you? Oh, como esta usted means how are you? That's what the Rosetta Stone did for us. And this mysterious Egyptian language written in these little bird forms and symbols called hieroglyphs, they had no idea what they meant. And now they could figure it out. And it opened up a whole new world of what the Egyptians were like because of what they had written down in those hieroglyphs. Likewise, God the Father would remain a mystery to us unless Jesus had come. We learn about God's basic character and requirements from the Old Testament, but we cannot see God and have a personal knowledge of him until Jesus came. So just as scholars looked at the Greek on the Rosetta Stone and were able to read the hieroglyphics, so also we see Jesus and we are now able to interpret and understand the Father. That's what we're learning this morning. Therefore, any idea that does not square with the Bible's picture of Jesus, any idea about God, well, we think he's like this, but Jesus wasn't like that. If these two don't square, then it's false. Your idea of God is false unless it squares with what Jesus is like. Likewise, any questions you have of God are answered by seeing Jesus. You might wonder, what's God like? Is he compassionate? Look at Jesus. Look at him touching the rotting arm of some leper who had called out for him for mercy, healing him with tender love. That's what God's like. You might wonder if God's able to handle your problems. Look at Jesus standing in the midst of a storm, calming the winds and the waves with just his voice. If he can do that, you think he can't handle your little problem? You might doubt that God could ever forgive you or receive you back when you've repented. Then listen to Jesus as he cries out from his cross, seeking mercy for the very men that were crucifying him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God's attitude toward children is seen when Jesus receives them for blessing in Matthew 19 and verse 13. 
God's grief over death as seen in Jesus' weeping at the tomb of his friend Lazarus in John 11:35. God's desire for our salvation is seen in Jesus' gospel call. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is saying to you this morning and to me, as he said to Philip, he that has seen me has seen the Father. So we hear Jesus' statement and we go back to Philip's question. Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Philip, as we said earlier, he wanted a display of some kind of divine power. Jesus' answer confronts this kind of thinking. A, a, a sensory feeling of God's presence is not what we need. The modern charismatic worship, we're going to experience God. We're going to sense him. We're going to feel him through our pulsating music and our emotions and, and all of this stuff. And that's what they want. That's not what we need. It is not in such a demonstration that we see God the God that enables to face our challenges and trials in this life. This was God's message to Elijah. When the great prophet, as we said earlier, came running to Mount Sinai, having been made weary and he was scared from his battles with the wicked Ahab and Jezebel, he, he was looking for assurance, reassurance of God's presence. God put Elijah on the mountain and gave him what he wanted, demonstrations of his power. But the prophet learned that the Lord was not in them. He said, I'm reading from 1 Kings 19 now, verses 11 to 12. He, and he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. Picture that in your mind. You're standing there like a hurricane coming through and not just bending some trees, but it's scattering these rocks. Pretty powerful scene, right? But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. I've never experienced a real earthquake. I felt a little tremor once in Peru, but you've seen the devastation that earthquakes happen. And here's Elijah up on that mountain. He's just seen wind scattering rocks and now an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So where did Elijah see God? Not in the fire fire, not in the earthquake, not in this huge wind. The Lord was in a still small voice, the quiet revelation of the word of God. How then do we overcome this sense that God is distant from us? Where are you in all of this, God? Do we need to see some kind of arm growing? Do we need to see some body pretending to be crippled and now they can walk? Is that what we need? How do we overcome this sense that God is distant from us? Where do we turn to see God and get strength and hope? And the answer is in God's word by understanding Jesus Christ. We see God in the Bible, opened up on our laps, often in a quiet place as we study his son, Jesus Christ. If we want to experience power to tear down strongholds, the Apostle Paul says that it comes from God's word, which will cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. If we want the fire of God to burn in us, let's remember the words of those downcast disciples who Jesus taught on the road to Emmaus. Afterwards, they said, did not our hearts burn within us? Why? Because he did some fancy miracle in front of them? No. While well, he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures. 
That's how they got the burning sensation in their heart. While the spectacular displays and spiritual highs are not enough to carry us through our trials, the knowledge of God through Jesus Christ as he is comprehended in the scripture is more than enough for us. It sufficeth us, or at least it should. Does this suggest uh, that, 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 that uh, this is based on reason or spirituality? And the answer is no, for the reason that Jesus went on to give later on in this chapter. Later on, we're going to read in verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. It is the third member of the Trinity who the Father and the Son send who gives the word of God power in our lives. By his presence, the Father and Son live in us as well through the Holy Spirit. So true spirituality then is biblical faith seeking diligently to know and understand Jesus and in this way seeing God and receiving the Spirit's power to live in accordance with the teaching of God's Word. Did you get all that? Let me say it again. What is true spirituality? It isn't this quiver in the liver feeling we get when the drums are beating and we're dancing and raising our hands to the beat of this vain repetition music. True spirituality is biblical faith as we seek diligently to know and understand Jesus and in this way seeing God and receiving the Spirit's power to live in accordance to the teaching of God's Word. That's what spirituality is and that's what we need. In his second letter, the Apostle Peter reminded us of the divine displays that he had seen. Peter refers to his being present on the Mount of Transfiguration. And in 2 Peter 1.17, he said, When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the Holy Mount. Wow, what an experience. What an experience. Did Peter then go on to say, and you all need that same kind of experience, some audio-visual display of divine glory, and that'll be enough for you. To the contrary, he went on to say in verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. He's talking about the word of God. Yeah, I had that experience, but we have something better than that. We have the word of God. God's word is enough for us. Peter says it will make God's presence real to us if we see and understand the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. He concludes his thoughts with two reasons to believe, which together give us our calling as witnesses to the world. The first is the undeniable authority of his word. Verse 10, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Now, Jesus doesn't mean that he's kind of like some ventriloquist dummy with strings attached to his mouth. Rather, because of his obedience to the Father and his unity of being with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, when Jesus speaks, it is God who is acting in and through his Son. Those who have believed in Jesus know this since it was by God's power in Christ's word that we came to this new life and saving faith. The way that we press on in faith, knowing that God is near to us, is to hear Christ's voice and know it as the truth of God. Christ's word is and should be enough for our faith, Jesus says. 
But if we think that we need more, he points us to his works as the second reason to believe. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe in me for the very work's sake. We think immediately of Jesus' miracles, which he often pointed to as proof of who he is. As per John 5, 36. But we can more fully get Jesus' meaning here by remembering his answer to John the Baptist when this great forerunner was tempted to doubt during his dark days when he was in prison by Herod. Messengers came from John and asked, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? John's people come to Jesus. Are you the one? Matthew eleven three. And here's what Jesus answered. Go and show John again these things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. That should answer your question. If Jesus of Nazareth was not the Savior sent from God, then there will never be any Savior. But Jesus is the Savior. He validated his coming by fulfilling all that was foretold about him in the prophecies, and he displayed in his words and deeds, deeds the work of God for the salvation of men and women and children like you and I. His dual testimony, his words and his works, leaves us without any excuses whatsoever if we remain as unbelievers. He's given us everything we need to know. He is God. Here's what God's like. And here's what the salvation that God brings to us. There's literally nothing that God can do for our salvation if we have not believed in his son through his teaching and his saving works. The reasons to believe show us how we are to serve as Christ's witnesses today. Jesus says that those who see him see God. So what do you and I need to show the world today other than that we show them Jesus as he is revealed in the scriptures? And that's why we preach about him all the time over and over and over again. We want to show the world Jesus. What good do we do to the world if we give them money, if we, if we give them some kind of help, give them encouragement, but we don't show them Jesus? What good is it? The, the world today, they're asking, where is God? Especially when horrible events happen. A shooting takes place and many people get killed. Where's God and all that? Hurricanes come and destroy property, take people's lives. Where was God and all that? By proclaiming God's word and doing his work, both of them together as one witness, we give the world what it really needs and it should be and it is truly enough for any and all who believe. Our calling then is to show them Jesus and through Jesus bring them to a knowledge of God in saving faith. That's what the gospel is all about. It was enough for Elijah to hear God's word in the quiet voice on the mountain. And so the prophet then went down from the mountain back into the world to do God's work. It will also be enough for us to see and comprehend Christ through faith in his word, to feed on his promise, to bow down to his commands and receive his gift of salvation in our hearts. But how Easy it is to live without comprehension of Jesus, just as the earlier disciples did. Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, he said in verse 9? Let's make sure that we do know him, that we hear his call, that we comprehend what he has shown to us about the Father, and especially that we know about his grace for salvation through the costly gift of his own son. Show us the Father. Our hearts cry out with Philip. In answering, Jesus says, he that has seen me has seen the Father. This means that the key to the Christian life, to endure in the faith 
and growing in grace is looking always to Jesus and in him seeing God displayed. We'll never advance from needing to be with Jesus and we'll never graduate from looking to him for the answer. We will never grow out of needing the life and the power that only he can give. Jesus is God's provision for us through the Holy Scriptures. And then we will feel the presence and know the reality of God in our lives, and there's no other way. In this way, Jesus really is enough for us. And we have tried throughout this sermon to hold him up and let you see him, because in seeing him, you see God. He's enough. He's enough for whatever you need, and he is enough for salvation. As the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, you remember that story? Put up on a, on a rod, and they said, look and you'll live. And we hold up Jesus, and we say, look and you'll live. You just have to look to him. Childlike faith, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Look to him. He's God in the flesh. He's come to seek and to save sinners just like you. He will forgive you. Repent. Repent of what? Repent of your unbelief. Repent and believe the gospel. Believe this good, good news that God has come in the flesh to seek and to save sinners like you. And he will forgive you of all of your sins. Cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And he will give you eternal life. Such good news. Such good news. And we call upon you. In fact, we have the authority to command you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Let's pray. Father, we have tried our best to hold up your son, uh, to show Jesus, because if we see him, we see you. And we want to see you. And he is enough. He is enough. If we see him, we see you. We want to know what you're like. We look at your son. And we tried to do that this morning. Give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Give us the faith to believe. Help us to grow in grace as a result of seeing Jesus a little more clearly this morning and thus seeing you more clearly. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for revealing the Father to us. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son to reveal you to us. Thank you, dear Father and Son, for sending your Holy Spirit who empowers your word. We have preached your word this morning. Now make it powerful to the edification of this flock this morning. Build them up in the most holy faith. Let them see you clearer than perhaps they've ever before. And let them see their calling to show Jesus to this world. Help us to be good soldiers, brave enough to do that. Help us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.